A little background on me, I've lived up here in the area since 1978, so I've seen many changes here. Um, I'm deeply concerned about what's happening in our tri-community, and as we all are. The CSD has been hearing many concerns from numerous uh, members of our area on a large scale regarding the illegal grows popping up throughout their, our district. We have limited powers that we can control this as to why we're all here today um, we can't address everything but due to our jurisdiction therefore the csd has decided to host this event and invite the sheriff and representatives to come here and give the opportunity to address your questions and concerns so with that i'm going to turn it over and introduce everybody well good morning thank you for coming out today and i certainly understand your concern uh, your concern is similar to what we're hearing and dealing with in Lucerne Valley, 29 Palms, all over the rural areas in our county. It's also in LA County, as you're probably all aware. Uh, this problem is a direct result of Prop 64 and the legalization or decriminalization of marijuana. Ultimately, if, if you uh, watched that piece of legislation or actually that ballot measure, it changed the cultivation of marijuana from a felony to a misdemeanor. So there are very little in the way of consequences for us to deal with these folks on the criminal side. Now we're going to talk more today about how we're going to address it and what we're currently doing. The additional funding that the Board of Supervisors has allocated to us so that we can increase our presence. We had, prior to July 1st, one marijuana enforcement team for the entire county. Now we'll have five. There are a thousand grows that we need to go after. The Board of Supervisors is committed to giving us the resources that we need to attack this problem. Uh, I think the ultimate answer is going to be going after them civilly. Creating a county ordinance, and the county's working on it currently, to fine them criminal or, or, uh, civilly for growing marijuana and fine them based on a per plant, whether it be $5,000 per plant or $10,000 per plant, that's gonna send a message and that will keep it from happening. We can go to a grow today and cite everybody there because it's just a misdemeanor and they'll pay the $500 fine and they're right back at it. They'll continue to pay that every day because they make so much money. So we have to hit it in a different way. Uh, we have some uh, folks from the assembly here as well as our congressmen today. Uh, they're working with us. DEA's partnered up with us. Code enforcement at the county's partnered up with us and as well as the CSD. That's what it's going to take. It's not just a criminal problem. We can't address it that way. We have to use all of the resources available to us and we're committed to doing it. Uh, we're we're very, being very effective in Lucerne Valley and 29 Palms as well. And we've already hit six grows this week uh, in this community and seven the week before. So uh, we're going to keep the pressure on, trust me. And, and so I consider the folks out here like my people because I lived here for so long. But uh, as you probably all read in the paper, uh, I have one week left and the Board of Supervisors appointed uh, the under sheriff Shannon Dykus, who's very familiar with the desert, so he gets to sit in the hot seat starting next Saturday. <laughs> but I can tell you, he's committed. He's on the same path. CCW is not that. Well, that's what we're talking about today. But CCWs aren't going to change. We'll continue to issue them like we have been. We'll continue to attack the criminal element and work with all of our partners to make a difference. So I'll let Shannon say a couple of words as well. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, as the Sheriff mentioned, I'm a desert dweller, folks, and I understand why you're upset. We're absolutely upset. The fact that the tools that we need to fix the problem don't exist, but as you see, we've got help. And these are the folks that are committed to us and being able to do the job. Uh, the sheriff mentioned CCWs and a number of things. What I want to reassure all of you, the path the sheriff has taken, the same path will be continued. I plan in a very short period of time, because we have such great support from the Board of Supervisors, we'll be adding two more deputies to the Victor Valley Station and we'll take care of this area and you'll see our patrol crease across all of our county stations. 
And that's something we've been working on for a while and that little thing called COVID kind of threw us off just a little bit, but, but no, we're keeping the course. And uh, I've had the absolute best mentor I could possibly have. And I know when to throw grace at the problem. And I also know when to bring the 10 pound hammer and don't think I'm not afraid to use it. Thank you. Good morning, I'm uh, Jason Anderson with the District Attorney's Office here in San Bernardino County. Uh, it's an honor to be here in front of you. I think the turnout for everybody here uh, speaks volumes about uh, the positive culture that the two gentlemen have helped create in the Sheriff's Department in this county uh, for the last 30 some years. Uh, John and Shannon have done a phenomenal job uh, and it has certainly been a pleasure to work alongside them and continue to do so along with their personnel who are here today. Uh, those issues that are unique up here in terms of these grows, as John was saying, um, we have to attack it a different way uh, from the DA's office. For the last two months, we've been working with the Sheriff's Department, uh, the Board of Supervisors, and also uh, some of our local uh, lawmakers that are here today, and also Congressman Obernolte. Uh, the difference is, as John said, the, the old way of being able to penalize people for crime uh, is uh, continuing to go away because a lot of the laws that are being passed in Sacramento. But uh, the areas in which we need to get more creative, and I'll talk about them in the question and answer section, uh, is we have a specialized prosecution unit uh, that actually already does a lot of environmental law protection. They do a lot of consumer affairs protection. And the recipe that the sheriff was talking about is that when you decriminalize something, but then you try to regulate the legality of something, you're going to push an underground market. And that underground market is going to try to beat the profit margin of the people who are going to do it legally. And everybody who's doing it legally figures out there's no punishment for me to do it illegally, so I might as well do it illegally. Uh, and that's the recipe that everybody knew was coming from those of us in law enforcement, but our lawmakers didn't want to hear it uh, because um, uh, of the current uh, trend uh, as it relates to actually holding people responsible for crime. So what I'm committing to all of you is that um, through our resources, uh, we will be looking at this from a landowner situation, uh, which is to give individuals notice about what conduct may be going on their land uh, so that we can actually go and hit hard the person who has the most, most at stake. Uh, we're concerned about water rights. Uh, we're particularly concerned about environmental rights because of the pesticides and everything uh, that is used uh, to make these crops grow. Um, and the one area in terms of the irony is, is that um, even our most liberal lawmakers can get behind the environment. Uh, and this is an area where we think we might actually have some common ground. So uh, that's the way we're going to attack it. Um, as uh, the sheriff said, the Board of Supervisors has been very supportive of us. Uh, one of the things that we will do moving forward is we're actually going to reach out and have some contract environmental lawyers uh, to work with the DA's office uh, to attack it on the civil end. Um, and so I'm just pleased to be here because I know a lot of you are going to have questions when we get to that point. Uh, and uh, whatever those are, I'll hopefully be able to answer them in a more detailed way. Uh, but know that uh, the team up here uh, is all committed to approaching this in a different way uh, because somewhat of the old uh, crime and justice way, the rug's been pulled out from underneath us. Um, and we realize that to do our duty um, on behalf of you guys, uh, we need to be more creative uh, and we're not going to rest until we, we get all this stuff out of your, uh, your neighborhood. So thank you very much for being here. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see everyone here and thank you all for turning out in support of the safety of our community. I'm Congressman Jay Obernolte and I want to give you a little bit of an update about why this is such a problem here in the high desert. I've spoken to a lot of constituents and some of them say this, well we know that cannabis cultivation is legal in some parts of the state, it's legal in some of our cities here in the high desert, so some people are doing it without a license, why is that such a big deal? Well I'll tell you why that's such a big deal. First of all, it's having a catastrophic impact on our natural resources. These illegal cannabis growers are stealing millions and millions of gallons of water. They drink, drill illegal wells or they tap into our water supplies. They are stealing megawatts of power. They tap into power lines, they bypass meters, and you know the way utility rates are calculated, we all pay the costs when that occurs. As the district attorney has said, they are using illegal pesticides. Pesticides that are Ill illegal not just here in California, but anywhere in the United States because they are so toxic. First of all, that's a hazard to our law enforcement. We've had these guys come back with rashes up their arms from handling these plants, but also, all of that pesticide toxicity winds up in our ground our, our groundwater because it washes off those plants. So this is why this is such an important issue for us to solve. Also, I know living in this area, many of you have been uh, subject to the intimidation tactics that these growers use. 
We've had people shot at, we've had people yelled at, we've had people unable to access their own homes because of this intimidation. And I'll tell you something that I learned just yesterday that blows my mind. I was on a coordination call with the U.S. Forest Service talking about the response to the lava fire that's burning in Northern California. And I heard something that I could not believe. Do you know that part of that lava fire is burning right now because the Forest Service was unable to fight it because of illegal marijuana cultivators shot at the firefighters when they showed up to fight the fire. Okay, that's what we're dealing with. That's why it's so important that we solve this problem. So the solution to this is twofold. First of all, as the sheriff has said, we need to strengthen criminal penalties against this illegal activity. Right now, large-scale cultivation of marijuana in the state of California is a misdemeanor. That is crazy. Small-scale cultivation, maybe that should be a misdemeanor, but large-scale cultivation absolutely should be a, penalty, a felony. And I know that our state representatives are working on fixing that. But also, we need to give these guys the resources that they need to help fix this problem. And those resources need to come not just at a county level, not just at a state level, but also at a federal level. So we've been trying to help with that. Congressman Mike Garcia, who represents Palmdale and Lancaster, and I partnered last month and sent a letter to the, D the uh, Attorney General demanding that he enforce federal law in California as regards illegal marijuana cultivation. It's illegal in the state of California, but it's also illegal under federal law. And the DEA has the resources to help us fix that problem. So just a couple of weeks ago, they came in and helped the LA County Sheriff Department do the largest bust of illegal marijuana cultivators ever in county history. They shut down hundreds of those operators, and uh, we want that to happen here. So we sent another letter yesterday to the Attorney General saying, thank you very much for helping LA County. We need that help here in San Bernardino County too. So I'm hopeful that that's gonna result in some federal action on this issue. And lastly, I want to talk about something that I find very alarming. And I think it's one of the things that's allowed this kind of activity to flourish. And that is a lack of respect and a lack of resources for our law enforcement professionals. We have been living through an era. Over the last year, where we've got people who think it's a good idea to defund our police. And unfortunately, we're seeing the consequences of that. And uh, ju just two days ago, uh, our Attorney General here in California, he's new, Rob Bonta is his name, I know him very well, he released a report on crime in California in 2020. And I encourage everyone to read the summary to that because you will find it truly alarming. Here is what the consequences of defunding the police are. Homicides in California last year were up 31%. Aggravated assault up 9% and arrest rates in almost every category of crime were down substantially. And even more alarming to me is that our young people are being taught a lack of respect for law enforcement. And I think in long term that is very, very dangerous. Firearms related crimes against law enforcement uh, in California last year were up 30%. And crimes against law enforcement with other kinds of weapons were up 60%. 60% because people don't respect these guys and the job they do. So we need to let them know not only that we respect them, but we need to get them the resources that they need to do their jobs and to keep us safe. So I'm gonna to work to do that at the federal level. I know my colleagues are working at the state and the local and the county levels to get that done too. And all of us working together, I think uh, we're gonna make a big dent in this problem. So thank you for being out here in support of this. It is tremendously important and we need everyone working together to solve this problem. My name is Tom Lackey and I represent, uh, well, part of this community. Uh, the lines are really kind of goofy, how uh, Smitty and I share this, this region here. I, I extend all the way to Wrightwood, but I also go all the way to Interstate 5 uh, to the west. I have a really big area, all of us do up here, but one thing you should know about me is that I was raised in a desert community called Boron. Most of you may not even know where the heck that place is. But uh, so I, I understand small community benefits, I understand small community challenges, and I also understand the need for water. And I will tell you that uh, part of the, the majority of my district is Lancaster, Palmdale area, and I don't know how much you're aware of the uh, illicit grows in LA County, but they're pretty, they're very similar to, to what you have here in this part of uh, your community. 
I had the privilege of seeing how bad it was. Uh, both sheriff's departments, both LA County and San Bernardino County have flown me uh, over to see how bad this really, really is. And the visual, I think there's some pamphlets passed around. You, you can see the, uh, the complexity of this problem. The problem is that these operations in large, the majority of them are funded not by just uh, untrained business people. These are cartels, folks. These are cartels. Uh, we've identified um, the Mexican cartel is, is not the only cartel that's here. Uh, we have the Chinese cartel and we have the Armenian cartel that have been identified. And the cartel, they don't care about arrests. They don't care about their people going to prison. What they care about is their bottom line and that's the dollar. The dollar is the only thing that drives the way they think. And they don't care about these, these people that are actually doing the hard work out in the heat um, and stealing the water. They don't they, they just assume that they all go to prison and they would actually uh, just replace them. The way we stop this is going after the dollar and, and destroying these, these uh, I don't know, operations. And I was able to see some success. Uh, as was mentioned by some of the earlier speakers, LA County, they have a sheriff there that is pushing back against the, uh, the political tide, um, which dismisses this problem. But he has uh, shown some real courage, and uh, he seized 1.3 billion, with a B, billion dollars worth of cannabis just two weeks ago. So I'm telling you, there's reasons to be optimistic. Every, there are people in leadership that understand the hurt that this is bringing to our community. They understand the fact that uh, water is being stolen. Do you, do you realize each plant takes about three gallons of water a day? And you, you consider the, uh, the hundreds of thousands of plants that are being grown right uh, before us. It's devastating what it's doing to each of us, and we're funding it, quite honestly. Uh, that's... That's so un-American, and I, I don't understand why there's any pushback politically, but there is. You should know, I, I sit on, I'm the Vice Chair of Public Safety, I'm also a retired Highway Patrolman of 28 years. So I feel like I, I understand, thank you. <laughs> Not used to hearing applause for, for uh, public safety. I, I, I'm the Vice Chair of Public Safety, and it is, uh, it's quite a challenge. It, I'm alarmed at the position people take, and uh, we, we, we've got work ahead of us. And just know that you have uh, somebody that's up there that's proud to fight and stand for traditional values and, and, and what actually makes our community strong. And that's, I'm so excited to see so many people out here in the picking heat. I mean, that shows commitment, this shows engagement. You haven't lost faith. And I just want to say thank you for caring. And I know you're going to beat us up in a minute, and that's your job. Um, but I'm very, very proud of you. I'm proud to represent you, and uh, let's do it together. Thank you. My name is Sen uh, Rosalicia Ochoa Bogue. I'm the newest senator for Senate District 23, which makes me your senator, your newest elected senator, and I'm very grateful to be here. Let me just get right off and say that I'm a huge um, supporter of our law enforcement and I've had great conversations with many of our district uh, attorneys and um, some of our sheriff, or one of our sheriffs, I haven't had an opportunity yet to meet with our newest sheriff, but um, I want to say that I am very passionate about our public safety because I speak as from a mother's perspective. I want safe communities because I think that's important for my children to grow up in. I also believe that it affects, as a former realtor, it affects your, our real estate values, as well as our safety and wanting to have that long-term uh, community feel. And so I am a huge advocate for our public safety, our families, and education. So, grateful to be here. I do want to really bring highlight. First of all, I want to second um, every message that has been said today by all of our speakers thus far. They are absolutely correct. And as a new senator um, in, in, in California, in Sacramento, it's been very interesting to see the context in which we are working. So, I'll just say it right now. I, I ran as a Republican. I am a Republican. But I need you to understand. Thank you. Thank you. 
But those who are not Republicans, I want you to know that I also understand that once I am elected, I represent all of your voices. And I take that very too much to heart. Um, having said that, I, need, I think it's important for everybody to understand the context in which we are working as conservative value, as conservative voices in Sacramento. Um, as you may already know, we have our governor who's been a Democrat for now three terms, right? Out of 40 senators that make up the legislature, so we have the governor, we have 40 senators, and out of the 40 senators, there are only nine Republicans. Nine Republicans. And out of the 80 assembly members that make up the state legislature that, that bring the laws uh, forward, um, out of those 80 assembly members, only 19, 19, right, yes. are Republican. 19. Two of them are right here with me today. So I want you to understand the context of that, how that works, because in order to pass any piece of legislation, we have to have, uh, for most of the bills, um, especially in public safety, we have to have at least half of the uh, plus one in order to pass those bills. So this is why I'm such an advocate for balance in the legislature. Wherever you are on the political spectrum, I respect it. I think everyone has different life experiences and will have different perspectives, but dialogue is incredibly important. And we're missing that dialogue on many of these very important issues, which is why I am here. I'm a much better listener than I am a, a speaker, so I apologize for that. But I'm a very, I have an open door policy. I sit down with all stakeholders to make sure that I listen to every side of the story so that we can bring that balanced policy. And unfortunately, we're not having that in, in Sacramento. So I'm eager to be your voice, to be a listening ear today, most importantly, to listen to what the concerns are, to understand what some of the re solutions will be or should be, and take it up to Sacramento. As Assemblymember Lackey, I have the blessing to be the vice chair for the public safety in, um, in, the, in the Senate. But I'm only one Republican on that out of five members in that, in that uh, public safety committee. So it is very difficult. I am very much a lone voice on many other times, but I do engage in conversation because I feel such a huge responsibility to make sure that I express and convey your voice and the message and the concerns in public safety. So with that, I encourage you to stay involved. As a new senator, I can tell you that your voice is very important. When you call, when you email, when you visit our offices, when you send a letter, and you let us know what your position is on a certain bill, we listen. I listen. Because it's important for me to make sure that I truly represent my district. So having said that, thank you very much for the time. I look forward to hearing your questions. Seek us out, please. We are here to listen to your concerns. Any ideas, I'm in open ear. And I look forward to our continued collaboration and representing you in Sacramento. Thank you. Good morning. I am Thurston Smith, your representative for the 33rd Assembly District. Most of my friends, or you might know me as Smitty. I served in Hesperia City Council for eight years, four years on the Mojave Water Agency, a total of 14 years being elected in Hesperia. But the 33rd, just give you an idea how big the 33rd Assembly District is. It starts about EB Road here to the east, goes all the way north to Trona, if you know beyond Red Mountain, follows the Kern County line, San Bernardino County line, out to Nevada, cuts over the mountains, the Cajon Pass Ranchero Road, up through Big Bear, Lake Arrowhead, down around the corner to 29 Palms, covers six, Highway 62 at San Bernardino, Riverside County line, all the way out to Arizona. It's the second largest district in the state. And I'm representing everybody in that state. I've been to all ends of the district. But I am fighting in Sacramento. You heard the numbers, we're outnumbered. But we are not giving up the fight for our region, our rural communities, and our values. I am way proud of everybody showing up out here. They say it might be a little warm. It's really cool for being in the desert, I think, so far. Wait a couple hours. But we've been able to work with the sheriff, myself and uh, Assemblyman Tom Lackey, We've done raids out in Lucerne Valley and Newberry Springs. We were watching, the because they watch us come in on Highway 18. So the phone calls go out, they scatter like eh, cockroaches when the lights come on. But when we were out there, 
the sheriff says, look at those guys on the hill with binoculars watching us with binoculars. Very, very scary what they could do that quick to us and our men and women in uniform. But I'm very proud of this coalition that's been put together. Big round of applause for Don Bartz and Kim for putting this together. We have a bigger voice working together instead of a bunch of little individuals representing you. The famous ad is, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. We are here to eradicate the problem that is going on up here. Legislation that will propose probably next year, I'd love it to take it to a felony. It's going to be very hard uphill battle in California. But we got the DA, uh, DA here and the sheriff working with us to try to get that going forward. The environmental side, because everybody in California is a big environmentalist. The chemicals that they're using, putting back in our uh, groundwater, contaminating our water table, is going to be a big fight that we're going to take on. But I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, staff says I'm crazy, I usually give out my cell phone, but my office number is 760-244-5277. Just like I said, we rep me and Tom represent half of you. Reach out, even if you're over here at Sheep Creek, call our office, we work together for all of you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you for coming out here today. Um, this is great to see this many people in the community out here. I'm Don Bartz. I'm the general manager of the Community Services District. And I've been your manager for 13 years out here. I have approximately 30 years in management in water um, in different agencies up here in the high desert. And so what's going on now is different than I've ever seen before. We have never had the amount of grows and illegal use of water um, ever that I've seen in my career. As an example, our water usage for May of this year was 36% higher than last year at the same time. 36%. So when, you, when you're running a system and you want to provide enough water for all of the customers who are paying customers, and you know, you, you have a balance there. You know, maybe a 25%, 30%, maybe 40% excess water that you can produce at any one time. And we hit 36%. It's really unsustainable. Um, when you, you talk about the grows out here and the theft of water, is there anybody here who has not seen the parade of water trucks, the, the cubes of water on the back of the trailers? Is there anybody here who has not witnessed that over the past year? Two years. Two years, okay, two years. Yeah, it's been going on, it's been going on for a while. So, to put this in perspective for you, we have the average customer, you know, uses maybe 15 units of water a month. You know, that, that's about average. We've had customers that have used 1,100 units of water in one month. 75 houses worth of water for one grow. And legally, we can't do anything. We have to provide water to them because they are, they're connected to the system. You know, so we're looking at some things to, to change the rates for the really, really high-end water users. Um, will probably not affect anybody that's out here in the audience today. But those are things that, that we're working on. If you look at how much water that is, to put it in perspective, if you have one acre of land and that piece of land is four feet deep in water in one month, that's how much water one customer used almost 1% of our entire district out of 7,200 customers. So that's, that's unsustainable and, and you can't really prepare for that at all. You know, we're, we're as prepared as we can be. We're gonna make sure that everybody has water supplied to their house, but it really puts a strain on the system and with the water theft, it's even worse. We have areas of the district that are remote and they will be out there all night long with the water trucks and the water totes. Um, unlicensed, unregistered, a lot of them. People who are not qualified to be driving these vehicles, stealing water all hours of the night. And it affects everybody because we have to run the water system. It's, it's theft. And so we really appreciate all of the electives up here in the Sheriff's Department who have helped us with this and trying to get a handle on it. Um, we are, we're a water agency. We don't have police powers. We can issue fines for theft. Um, our employees have been threatened. Um, we don't like that. We don't want to put anybody in danger. We know some of the people in the community have been threatened too. 
we've heard you can't get to your residences. It's, um, it's beyond anything that I've ever seen in my career in water. And we're, we're really happy that, that this is um, something that hopefully can be under control here in a short period of time. We've considered all options. Um, like I say, we can't pull meters. We have construction meters that are out. We're going to be pulling those construction meters, but what that will do is encourage more theft. Um, we're installing a water station down on Sheep Creek Road, um, which should be operational within the next couple of weeks to sell water to people who have um, the water trucks and such, but at least they will be paying for the water at that point. So, you know, we're doing the best, absolute best that we can do. Yeah, okay, trail cams at every hydrant, a great comment. We've had trail cams, probably 30 trail cameras out at different hydrants in the remote areas of the district, which were promptly stolen. So, and we, you know, we have all kinds of great pictures of people stealing water in the brochure that you see. There's some guys out there filling cubes up with the, with the fire hose out of a hydrant in the middle of the night in a remote area. And what do you do with that? We can't identify them. Um, the amount of water that they steal may be maybe 10 or $15 worth of water at a time. And you know, so we're, we're, we're trying to strike a good balance there on how we're dealing with this, but, but I think we're doing good. Um, the board is very active in providing us with the resources that we need with our elected board here at the district. And in conjunction with the, um, with the electeds and the sheriff's department, um, I, I think we're going to get it under control in a short period of time. Um, I'm in personally asking the representatives and the law enforcement personnel to help get our communities back. And it's going to take a lot of resources, um, a lot of dollars from the, from the state and from the county and from the feds. Um, but these are your dollars that would hopefully be coming back to the community to help protect your system. Um, if, you, if you steal water right now, um, you know, it'd be a misdemeanor, maybe a $500 fine from the district if we can find out who you are. Um, we are looking for people, if you see groves in the community or you see people stealing water, to call it in, contact the authorities. Um, if you see areas where they're stealing water regularly with the water trucks, we wanna be informed too. Um, we're looking at doing some things with shutting down some hydrants so they can't draw the water um, from these remote areas, but it will push them into um, probably more populated areas. Um, we don't wanna cause problems for anybody that lives in the community, but we're, we're doing what we can do. And with that, I think I'd like to um, just move on to the pre-submitted question portion of our um, event today. And with that, thank you very much for coming out. I hope you enjoyed the nice big rainstorm we had this morning. Had about 10 drops of water on the windshield on the way in. That's a, that's a storm out here. So, but thank you very much. All right, my name is Kim. I'm the board secretary here at the district. Uh, we received a lot of questions. Most of them were very similar, so they were consolidated and compiled into about 15 questions. So let's go ahead and get started. What information can law enforcement provide to the community about what they are doing about the illegal grows? It seems that we are not being informed about any action taken. Uh, we are trying to advertise as much as we can all the grows that we're taking down and the results of it, the amount of product we're taking and the arrests associated with it. Uh, we'll continue to do that and continue to provide that information. You probably saw some things uh, over the last couple of weeks here locally and then countywide for the last year plus. But I'll be quite honest with you, this, pro this problem grew so fast, we just couldn't keep up with it. And now with the allocation of additional resources, about $2 million from the Board of Supervisors, we'll assemble those five marijuana enforcement teams and they're already starting to hit the ground and you saw some of it over the last two weeks out here. And we'll continue to keep the pressure on. The legislators that spoke earlier, Smitty and Lackey, both are working as hard as they possibly can to get the law changed. But as I mentioned before, the only way we're gonna slow this down is to start finding them and the county understands it the county is working closely with county council and the other department heads to come up with that ordinance so that we can start finding them the county is also strengthening code enforcement as well hiring more code enforcement officers just to give you a little history when we take when we take down one of those grows the only thing we can take 
without authorization in the search warrant is the marijuana. You can't bulldoze down the building. You can't take the, the hoop houses is what they're called. You can't take those because they're not illegal. So unless the judge authorizes us to take those or bulldoze them down, it can't be done. If we do it, we'll just get sued and we'll all have to pay for it. So we just leave them there, unfortunately, but code enforcement can follow up because it's not permitted in the county ordinance to do that large scale commercial grow in most places. So the county can then follow up with code enforcement and they can start attaching civil fines to either the property owner, whether they know or not, if it, the property owner doesn't know, they notify them and then they're responsible for cleaning it up. If the grower is actually the property owner as well, then they get fined for code enforcement from code enforcement and they ultimately have to pay to get it cleaned up. So we'll continue to work on that as well. And uh, it's, it's a challenging problem. The law's got ahead of us as well. You heard from the assembly members, but, but I think we're on the right track. We're getting there, but it's gonna be a work in progress. And we're making a difference in other parts of the county and we are here as well. So uh, we'll do the best we can to keep up with it. Why is nothing being done about the illegal grows near schools? There is one near Quail Valley and Baldy Mesa Elementary. Shouldn't these grows be prioritized for destruction? The smell is horrible. There's a lot of trash and chemicals around our kids. Yeah, there's grows everywhere and some are near schools, some are near houses and as soon as we get made aware of them, we prioritize them, we get a search warrant and we go after them. Unfortunately, there's now over a thousand illegal marijuana cultivation sites in the county. Um, there are a number of them in this part of the county as well. That number was about 500 two or three months ago. Now it's over a thousand. Part of it is because all of you are reporting that information to us. So I encourage you to give us the addresses. Keep sending us the information so we know where they're at. And we'll continue to keep the pressure on them. The team that's assembled, uh, Lieutenant Mark Brocco's here from Narcotics, and he's leading the charge from our Narcotics Division. I'll have him come up in a minute and he can get, pro provide some additional information. But your captain out here, Jeremy Martinez, and your lieutenant and the sergeant that's assigned here, Paul Solario, they're all aware of the problem and, and they're, uh, they're doing everything they can as we ramp up this additional group of five marijuana enforcement teams. Uh, and I will mention, and, and the congressman mentioned it too, but um, DEA, Bill Bodner is the special agent in charge out of the LA office and he and I had a great conversation two weeks ago, uh, followed up again with our narcotics guys just this week that the uh, United States Dis Department of Justice and DEA are gonna do some things that we can't do here locally. They're sending out notices to the folks that are hauling the water, if they can find the business, the folks that are providing support to these illegal cultivations, whether it be a well driller or whoever it might be, and they're gonna put them on notice that if they continue to be involved in that activity, there's a way in the federal system to seize their equipment. So that's gonna come from the federal side. When I talked about putting everybody together in a team to address the problem, that's one of the things we cannot do locally, but the federal government can do it. And I heard from Bill Bodner just recently about that, and they're, and they're following through with their promise. The United States Attorney's Office in LA is committed to doing it as well, and, and in my opinion, that's a big step. And Congressman Obernolte is a big part of that, putting the pressure on DEA and the United States Department of Justice to make sure that we have the tools that we need. All of this together is what's gonna make the difference, not just one thing, and, uh, and I think we're on the right track. Property values are going down, Joshua trees are being destroyed, the soil is being degraded with additives and pesticides um, around our properties. What can be done about this? Thank you, I agree with you, but I don't agree with the Joshua tree being designated an endangered species. But what he's getting is a problem of the illegal grows. In fact, the illegal, illegal grading. She turned me off. Illegal grading. The illegal grading and they need to be fined for tearing down those Joshua trees because that's what they're getting away with, all these illegal grows. And it was mentioned earlier when myself and Tom Lackey did a helicopter tour, is the water well drillers drilling wells without no permit from the county and stealing the water. That's a big issue. But I've been working, I've got a, uh, 
a fellow at UC Riverside. Where's my scientist at? Stand up and be recognized. There he is, there he is. <laughs> there, okay, there he is right here. We're working with UC Riverside to, uh, with a fellow to do the study for the chemicals going back into the groundwater table and how much water it takes to grow one marijuana plant, multiply that by tens of thousands of plants so we can get the state to realize how much water they're taking. You know, we've got rid of most of the agriculture out here, the alfalfa, but their water that they're still in the marijuana plants taking tens of thousands of acres and I think everybody knows what an acre feet of water is. So, thank you. So we just got a comment card that was unique from the pre-submitted questions. This one is, are there legal grows in our area, such as hemp or marijuana? Yes, th there are legal cultivation of hemp. That's legal in the county in most places. Uh, those plants look very similar to marijuana plants. They do smell the same, but they're not marijuana because they don't have the THC. It's a different type of plant. THC is the chemical in the marijuana plant that get, causes you to get high, in essence. So if it's a true uh, grower of hemp, they will not want to be anywhere near an illegal marijuana cultivation site because their hemp is tested regularly and if it exceeds 0.03% THC it's considered hot and they have to plow it under. Their hemp can become hot if it's close enough to a regular cannabis or marijuana grow. So they don't want to be anywhere near marijuana if they're a righteous hemp grower. Now our folks are trained on how to, to test the difference between the two to determine if it's actually hemp or if it's marijuana very hard to tell by looking at the plant but they know how to do it so there are several hemp grows that are absolutely legal and permitted by the county and ag weights and measures at the county uh, oversees that and permits them but there are still obviously plenty of that are growing cannabis or marijuana illegally there are only two communities in the in the county that allow commercial cultivation and that's needles and and adelanto Somebody tells me that it's legal in the city of San Bernardino, but I've not seen that. That very well could be the case, but I'm not sure. But I know for sure that Adelanto and Needles commercial cultivation is, is legal and it's regulated by those cities. Those are the only places it's legal to grow marijuana. But hemp is legal anywhere where it's permitted and, it's, and it falls within the code, by, the code guidelines of the county. These illegal grows are much bigger than can be handled by one agency. Also, I have heard that some of these grows are run by the cartel. Can the Army, Air National Guard, or other agencies be activated to assist law enforcement? I'll let Shannon answer, but his microphone's not working. <laughs> See, they're smart. They don't let the new guy talk or say anything. Uh, <laughs> So yes, we have a lot of federal partners and we can reach out to those federal partners. I know the sheriff mentioned DEA already. As far as bringing in the National Guard and resources like that, that generally goes to the governor's office. And at this point with the five teams that we spoke to earlier, we probably will not need those resources at this point. One other thing I would want to touch on too, and I know we see a lot of things and the big question is the bulldozing that, that you see going on in LA County. I've had an opportunity and I talk to Sheriff Villanueva regularly some of those things are really after the fact. So in other words, a lot of the property owners that didn't realize that they had illegal cultivation going on in their properties because they've only visited it one time a year, maybe once in 10 years, they realize that, hey, I didn't authorize this. Somebody came without my permission out of the property. Well, part of the court order is the destruction and abatement of their property so that they don't have the cost because frankly, some of them can't afford it, particularly in these rural properties. Of the illegal grows that do get raided, what punishments are actually handed down? Uh, we talked about that in the beginning. It's a misdemeanor for uh, cultivation of marijuana. Under Prop 64, it's legal to have six plants per person and one ounce of, of dried marijuana per person. Anything above that is illegal. And if it's 10 plants or it's 10,000 plants, it's still a misdemeanor with a $500 fine and a citation. That's what we're trying to get fixed. What about the poisons they're using? Yeah, so, so the, the, yes, that's just dealing specifically with the cultivation.
but the poison and uh, the uh, herbicides, pesticides, that's the, what the district attorney talked about, and we're working collaboratively on that as well, and I don't know if Jason wants to talk more about that. Yeah, the, the, that area is an area that still, if you're dealing with that, is typically going to be uh, punished as a misdemeanor. Uh, the difference could be uh, if we were able to get into business and profession code violations under 17200, what we're talking about there is perhaps felonies. Uh, if we have repeat conduct um, or we have um, uh, a violation of what otherwise would regulate the use of a lawful product that is used illegally, uh, we may be able to get uh, to a felony level on that. Uh, the one area that where we do still have um, uh, some teeth is uh, electricity theft uh, over a certain amount. Uh, you see that typically in the residential grows. Uh, Southern California Edison has always been very aggressive on that and they give us all the numbers that we need. Uh, the one area, aside from what the sheriff said in terms of just the tenders and the low fines that are given through the courts, um, we do have uh, some success in what is, in my opinion, the real troubling thing about all these grows is the, um, uh, the consequential uh, violent crime that occurs. Whether some of these grows are being robbed, whether some of the tenders are being robbed, uh, there's, very, there's people that are very uh, vulnerable at those sites. Uh, not that they shouldn't be doing it, uh, but uh, we have had some success in holding people responsible for um, felony commercial burglary, uh, also robbery, uh, in some instances assault with a deadly weapon. So when we have those, we don't like to see it, but we prosecute the people who are responsible for that uh, in terms of, of where we're going. But we, I still think that if you're talking about actually getting some enforcement, we can't continue to think about their traditional go to jail because there's not a whole lot of go to jail anymore even for crimes outside of cultivation uh, it really is the civil uh, and taking away what the basic resource is which is the land or the water away and it pushes these grows out of the county okay this one comes from a resident of el mirage we are on a well about eight to nine months ago the wells started going dry i see illegal grows drilling wells why are they allowed to do this and when water is so scarce out here not gonna work uh, i mentioned that earlier with the uh, water well driller not getting a permit and drilling illegal water wells we and the sheriff mentioned it we need to go after them and take their um water wells their pipes their fittings all the apparatus to grow and put a bigger dent in their pocket because five hundred dollars is nothing to them they make that in a couple minutes growing this marijuana it's a billion dollar industry we need to put a stop to it but that's taking the effect on the water table the all of the straws are taking it out and that's where we need to go after them make sure they're not doing it uh, in the county without a permit an extra hand now well we'll get to that we got we got extra questions here in a little bit. I'm hoping the majority of questions get answered with the pre-submitted, but we'll we'll have time for audience questions. All right. Can the illegal grows be built separately so that the excess water usage isn't paid for by regular water users? I don't think an increase across the board is correct since it isn't our fault these growers are here and we we have no benefit from them. Okay. Our board just recently enacted a high water user study to determine the impact of the grows and how we can make sure high water users with meters are paying their fair share for the un un uh, no, I can't talk. The demand, the high demand for water. We do not uh, normally, let's start over again. We do not want our normal water users to have to bear the burden of others. Additionally, we adopted a water theft ordinance to try to penalize water theft. However, water thieves are hard to catch and don't care about the fines. Our water uh, study will likely result in new rates with a third tier for those using the most water. We are hoping to recoup some of this cost of extra water demand and resources that these illegal grows are costing us. All right, we have another uh, audience submitted card question today. Um, what can be done to increase um, our cybersecurity um, for our different utilities? Uh, so I can take that since I've been involved with that at the federal, at the federal level. Uh, there has been a really alarming increase in attacks lately against 
our national infrastructure, particularly cyber attacks and particularly from malicious actors in other countries like Russia and China. So uh, uh, that's something that uh, everyone ought to be concerned about. If you followed the Colonial Pipeline hack that happened last month, we didn't really feel the effects of that here on the West Coast, but on the East Coast it disrupted the supply of gasoline to the entire Eastern Seaboard. And uh, I see a lot of people that are my age here in the audience. The last time I saw people lining up in their cars for gasoline was in the 1970s. And I thought I'd never see it again in my lifetime. And yet there were uh, a lot of stations in, on the East Coast, particularly in Washington, D.C., that ran out of gasoline and couldn't get any more. So this is of critical importance. And uh, these, these attacks are escalating. So we're doing a few things about that. First of all, we are instituting some programs at the national level to perform preemptive audits of our supply chain infrastructure, infrastructure including water. Uh, and then in the longer term, we are trying to be proactive about building uh, cyber capability here domestically. Uh, we've kind of fallen behind countries like China in getting an educated workforce uh, in areas like data science and cyber. And in fact, I had uh, my first two bills pass the House of Representatives last week dealt with this topic, establishing new research fellowships and new scholarships to get people into fields like artificial intelligence and uh, and uh, cybersecurity. So uh, that's uh, it's going to be a long-term problem. It's got a long-term solution, but we're working on it. Uh, let me also uh, just inform you, if you have a business or you're otherwise involved uh, in this issue in regards to cultivation or water, and your systems have been hacked, there are actually pretty good hacking uh, laws within California Penal Code. Uh, they've responded in the last couple of years, and so we've actually prosecuted people who typically you see do it because they're disgruntled employees who get fired and they hack into the system before they leave and send out ransomware. Uh, but it's actually very broad. It's very similar to identity theft. If somebody uses your name for any purpose and you don't give them permission, uh, then they could be responsible for a felony. It's very similar along the computer hacking. So don't be afraid that if you have an issue like that, obviously you're going to think all of a sudden it's going to be a business issue, it's going to be a software issue, you need to call in an expert. But if you feel that somebody's hacked in, into your system, uh, I would encourage you to make a report uh, with your local law enforcement agency, if it's up here with the Sheriff's Department, uh, because there actually are still some teeth, uh, more teeth in the, in, the, in the computer hacking law than there is in the, in the marijuana law. So don't think that that's kind of just a, a civil business issue, uh, that's actually can be a criminal issue. And I'll just point out here at the PPH CSD, we have a triple redundancy for our uh, monitoring system for our wells, tanks, all of that um, we are constantly monitoring almost all of us have it on our phone and are notified if there's any type of abnorm abnormality so we can switch over to a different operating server and we can also deploy field staff to keep the water running even if we get uh, shut down with our computers so. so that's an SCE issue we are affected just like you when the power goes out uh, we were just notified that we could be turned off at any moment here, which does take down our wells. It takes down our boosters and it makes it reliant on our water storage, which can be anywhere from a few hours to a day, just depending on the demand. Right now we're at all time demand. So if the electricity goes out, we're looking at a couple hours. And so we have to deploy generators. We have them on standby to go to our different sites and make sure we can keep the water flowing to you. Yes, we do. We're also a member of CalWARN, so we're able to draw on all of our other local water agencies for their resources. So if they're not currently utilizing their generators, um, we can deploy them. So Victorville is aware of our potential power outage in this area, it's starting from Sheep Creek and over, could be any time today. And uh, we're authorized to go to their yard and borrow their three huge generators to assist with our generators we already have on hand. Okay, so this is the last of the questions um, that we received via email. What can we as residents do to help stop all of the illegal growth? We want to enjoy our lives and not have to live with the smell and the criminals this activity that brings to town. Something needs to be done before it gets any worse. We would love to preserve our rural way of life. That's true. Absolutely. Preserve the, the, right, the way of life. I mentioned it before. Keep calling us and give us the information that you have as to where the grows are. 
If you see repeated trucks hauling uh, water back and forth, let us know. We're partnered up with the Highway Patrol. Uh, we've done it in Lucerne Valley and other areas as well. They'll come in with their commercial officers and stop those water trucks and inspect them. Oftentimes they're overloaded. Uh, when, they, when they change from one to the next, they'll have a trailer one day and then they'll have a U-Haul truck with the cubes in it the next. Chances are good they're overloaded. The CHP can take care of that. They can also stop the regular water trucks as well and determine if the driver's license and if the truck is safe. And they're towing them away if they don't fall within the requirements of the law. So let us know that and we can help uh, go after the grows as well as work with the CHP to attack the vehicles that are hauling the water as well. So we have five minutes left for audience questions. If your question has not already been asked, please come up to the shaded area on this side of the stage and use the microphone so everyone can hear you. All right. Sorry. Um, my question is for the sheriff. sheriff. Um, am I to understand that you're retiring? I, I am retiring, but I got a good guy that's going to follow me. Well, in that case, uh, Godspeed and uh, enjoy a well-deserved retirement. Thank you. However, my next question is for you, the new sheriff. Sir, we, we have a substation that is, in my opinion, uh, totally uh, underused. Will your department commit to a liaison officer that we as a community can walk in and give information? Because if we have to call your office, let's face it, you're going to have a young sergeant and lieutenant trying to cover your butt. Ex excellent question. <clears throat> so, yes, we're actually, uh, just to give it an example, we're working with Don and have been working with Don in terms of station and access. And just so you all know, <clears throat> you're looking at the new station. It's going to be right here in the park. We'll have better access, and like I said earlier, <clears throat> we're going to dedicate two more officers to the Victor Valley Station. The captain will be able to, chance to have a chance to talk with all of you. We're going to adjust the beats and make sure we have more coverage and take care of exactly what you're talking about and keeping people in the office. As far as staffing, trying to have, we have a lot of volunteers, and that's where you can help us. Becoming a COP and a number of those things, we use those folks regularly to make sure you have that, that uh, presence at the station when it's open, when the deputies are in the field. But we've got a number of liaison uh, deputies in the field already, and we'll have more service here to all of you. Excellent question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi. My question is directed uh, towards Jace, Jason Anderson and Don Bartz and possibly Thurston Smith. Um, I'd like to know if you folks have offhand the percentage of the legal grows in this area that your water agency is providing metered water to. Um, it's my experience out in Landers and 29 Palms area that the water districts are supplying metered water to the grows. Yet we hear publicly speaking that only uh, water is being stolen or there's illegal haulers. I don't see how there can be any comprehensive approach to a solution beyond criminal when we have our own water agencies that are providing water to these criminals. That, that is a very good question. Um, what happens a lot of times is people will t buy an existing house on a property. Um, it might be a five acre parcel and they have a water meter um, that's providing water to that house. We do not have jurisdiction to go in there and determine if they're growing hemp, if they're growing artichokes, um, they're inside the greenhouses. We are not law enforcement and we do not have a mechanism to go in there and shut their water off. What we can do though is look at the amount of water that's being used and if it's extraordinary. Um, we're looking at some um, rate changes for the very, very high end users. Again, I, I talked about before the average house uses 15. And so there, there's gotta be a sweet spot in there to where there's obviously some activity that is not sustainable that we're looking at. And if I could just comment real quickly on that, in terms of having access, if you needed it, that's an area where county code enforcement would be better equipped than the DA's office. Because county and code enforcement would need a lower standard uh, to be able to get access to that property than we normally would in law enforcement. The standard in law enforcement is probable cause. Code enforcement would be able to go in there administratively in a different way. Um, so, you know, we, there's not a whole lot that the DA's office can do on that. 
I appreciate the uh, I appreciate the awkwardness of the response, but I have a personal experience with the water agencies install water meters when there's no dwelling. They've installed meters on empty lots to provide water directly to the business of an illegal cannabis grow with no humanitarian need. And it's, it falls somewhat on deaf ears when you say you want to increase your water rates, but yet it's hard not to see where this benefits you financially. The water district is not making a profit off of selling water. Um, we also do not have the opportunity to to determine what they're going to do with the property. When when we set a meter and they put in a request for the meter, we do want to find out what it's going to be used for. If somebody somebody has a building permit for the house, that's fine. A lot of times we would have people who legitimately own a piece of property that they want to build on in four to five years, and they want to get some trees started on the property. And so we have to make judgment calls, but we are um, kind of restricted with what we can and cannot do regarding providing water. We do the best that we can. Hello, my name is Mary Jane Anderson. I hail from Pinion Hills, out on the county line. I was a public servant for 42 years, Snowline School District, Apple Valley, and San Bernardino. I just wanted you to hear those credentials, but not the most important one. I am a landowner, I am a mom, I am a wife. And I am not happy about the grows going out on 263rd. Now, here's the problem. It's just, it's not just the grows, it's the trash, it's the diapers, it's the crap all over our street. Now, I call Sheriff, I call, uh, I call San Bernardino County, and they say, oh, that's across the street, that's LA County line, you have to call LA County. So I call LA County, they don't come out because it takes them five hours to get there. So who am I supposed to call, Ghostbusters? I'll go ahead. I'm going to propose some legislation next year is to go after them criminally for the environmental issue, the trash. When we did our helicopter tour and we had Channel 4 News, I don't know if you've seen that on the news or not, but they are dumping their stuff from their motorhomes and their trailers right out into the desert. But let alone all the trash, it's a regular dump site that's going on out here. But that's how we, I want to try to go after it is the environmental side in California and go after them that way. And Tom can address it too. Okay, and I really appreciate you talking about Lucerne Valley and Needles and everybody else. What about us? What about Phelan? What about Baldy Mesa? And what about Pinion Hills? First of all, um, I have, you're definitely in my district if you're on the LA County line, so you need to come and get a card from me. And we'll help you specifically with your problem. Um, but it is a very significant issue when you're on that border and, and you just happen to be on the L.A. County side, you're right. You are many, many miles away and you have the labyrinth of L.A. County. So let us help you because we, we have contacts. So, yeah, please uh, get with me so we, we can help you with your problem. Thank you, and I appreciate you all being here. Hello, my name is Juliana Blackstone. I am a landowner in the Fuel and Baldy Mesa area. Uh, first thing I want to tell you is that uh, I want to thank every law enforcement and every representative, senator, uh, congressman, and congresswoman for your s service. Um, I worked in emergency medicine for 20 years. That was my first career. I'm well on my third now. And um, I know how difficult your job is. Uh, I know that it's not an easy one, especially when you meet people who don't necessarily agree with what you have to do for your job. So um, I want to make that clear. Um, I also want to say that um, I live, the corner of where I live, there's a lot of traffic. And I have noticed that when you've done bus, there is no traffic. So last year you did a bust in Victorville where you took down millions of dollars in marijuana and then the traffic stopped on my corner on that street. I have motorcyclists with empty backpacks going one direction, fill up the backpacks and go down the other direction. And then when you did the bust, I have no motorcyclists with no backpacks. Um, and the bust you did recently did the same thing. It emptied the streets. So even though I didn't know that it was happening and I found out on Facebook, um, I saw the fruits of your labor. I just want to make that clear. Um, the other thing, that the question I have is that since California has changed the law 
and effectively made it impossible for you to enforce it be over marijuana and that's illegally federal, then why is it possible to have more federal presence and a higher fine and imprisonment on that level? Um, I don't think that, the, that charging somebody civilly is going to work. Some of these people don't pay taxes. Some of them don't care about their credit, judgments, liens, they don't have property. How are you going to enforce a civil penalty when you have no teeth? You can't collect. Uh, I'll take that one. You are completely right about needing to bring more federal resources to bear on this problem. And that's why we are trying to loop the DEA in and to give our local law enforcement the extra tools that they need to prosecute these crimes. And uh, a lot of people don't know that because the criminal penalties were decreased, that also takes away some enforcement tools from that. For example, they can't get a wiretap warrant for a suspected grow operation. They have to try and tie it into some larger crime like money laundering. So that's why we're trying to get the DEA involved in that. I also share your concern about civil penalties. You know, these cartels, they don't care about civil penalties because you need to identify someone with assets to seize before a civil penalty means anything to them. That's why we have to put some teeth into the criminal penalties and that's why we have to get the federal agencies involved uh, to make these, uh, these crimes stick. Okay. We're about to ask the last question. If you have not had your question answered, on our booth over there, there are some blue question cards. Put your name and your phone number, there's a spot for it, your question, and we will route it to the appropriate representative so they can get in touch with you personally to answer your question. Okay, and then anybody who submitted a question online, I have the specifics in your question noted to be forwarded on as well. So if you haven't had it answered, it will be answered. All right, Robert. Everybody knows. So uh, I'd like to thank McMahon. I hate to see him leave, uh, but it looks like he's got a good replacement. Uh, as far as this cyber stuff, Cyber Command was stood up 15 years ago, and uh, their whole job was to do cyber protection for the infrastructure, which they're doing a horrible job of. And I think the federal government should put uh, pressure on them to uh, fix that problem. Second, you got a pretty powerful weapon for the desert called the desert tortoise. The uh, Department of Biological Diversity will fight tooth and nail if they are in the terrain, or if you got desert tortoise out there, which you have a protected species, that might be a weapon you want to uh, ascertain to uh, help you fight your fight out there. Because the minute they impact that environmentally, it impacts everybody. That's a protected species, and it gives you a very uh, valuable weapon to use against these guys. The other thing is, I, I guess I want to know what the reaction time is. I went down Wilson Ranch the other day. They're punching wells right now, so if you hurry up, you can probably catch them. Okay, so uh, they're, they're punching them. The guys out there, these are not normal pot growers. These are cartel guys. You'll see them out there with weapons. They've got the stuff barricaded. Now they're starting to barricade the roads. Now, if somebody's out there and these kids here in the desert are running around their quads and their ATVs, how long is it gonna be before one of them gets shot? Okay, right? I mean, we're willing to go after a kid in a lemonade stand for not having a permit, but we're not willing to go out and nail these guys with weapons. Okay, and these, are, these guys, they don't care about the law. The only people who care about the law are the people here. All right, because everybody here has to be right. Do we support law enforcement? Yes. Absolutely. Okay, this is a legal town. And the other thing is, I think the people here don't want to pay the fine through their water bills. Our water bills have doubled in the recent history. Okay, another rate just went into effect J July, and it's always, they use the water. Well, guess what? These people out here, we're not using that water. We've cut back. So there's got to be a way to stop it because we should not have to pay for the criminals out there that that idiot Newsom's let loose every day. Right on. Okay, 
So thank you. Thank you for your time. Good luck. And fix Cyber Command. They're broken, man. All right. Good news. Our representatives, even though I promised them to only have an hour here because they have events to get to after this, they're going to take a few more questions. So we're going to get down to gentleman in the hat. You're our last question. If your question is not answered as part of this, please fill out the blue question card and we'll make sure your questions get answered some way, somehow. Me? Thank you. So the, the situation we're here to talk about is happening mostly in rural areas in California, which tend to be generally more conservative. So I want to know what is the level of support, if any, of our current state and federal administrations where probably our votes don't count a whole lot in terms of their, you know, what they're looking for. Do they, do they hear us? Do they care? Thank you. Thanks for letting me ask. Right there. Hello. Thank you. I'll, I'll take that one. Yeah. Yes, so your voice does count and it does matter. And earlier I mentioned the, the context in which we're working as conservative voices, right? I represent this area, this is a conservative voice. I, um, we are limited, but I think the most important part is to make sure that we're engaged. One of the things that I made um, a commitment to was that once I, is this bothering you? Is that, is that noise kind of working? I'm hearing the noise, I'm sorry. One of the things that I've been committed to is to make sure that I advocate, that I speak up, and that I collaborate with those. So when I mentioned earlier that I was a good listener, I'm not alone. There's other, um, other voices that feel similar to what we are. So what I've been doing is trying to find that common ground with uh, people on the other side, or my colleagues on the other side, so that we can work collaboratively on issues that affect you, for instance. And we do have other um, other senators, in the, at least in the Senate, that actually represent rural areas. And I will be, I'll be committed. I, I, I give you my word to make sure that we reach out and we start working on these issues that we've, that I've been come aware of since taking office and making sure that we find that common ground and really truly be advocating. But most importantly, you must engage all your family members, all your your friends across the state to make sure that they speak up on the issues that pertain to you as well. Because unfortunately, if you don't live in, and, and I can, and you folks can vouch on this, when people call other electeds um, that are not your, your personal representatives, they don't take uh, credence to what you're, you're saying. So the most powerful voice is to speak up locally and then we speak up on your behalf. But have your your relatives, I always say goes, if you wanna have a voice and an influence on those that are not representative of your area, have those family members, those friends, those acquaintances, reach out to their local elected and be engaged. You must, I cannot emphasize how important your voice is in making sure that your local elected, whether here or across the state, hear you and see you. Unfortunately, and if I may, if you can do it in the most respectful and civil way, you'll get more out of it um, than being really, really angry. And that's just my personal voice based on what I've heard up in, in, the, in, in Sacramento. And you folks can add on to that if you'd like. Come on, there we go. September 14th is the most important vote. Number one recall this dictator governor that we have yes. and number two replace him with a conservative re representative with an r by his name let's change his state back and take it back over my name is michael gallagher i'm just going to give you a couple things uh there should be some kind of plotting uh for the uh, county assessor to know which of these plots are actually owned by someone. And if you go out here, you'll find a lot of these are squatters. They don't own the land, they just tear it up and everything else. I also heard that somebody uh, on the panel said Joshua trees are not protected. Uh, I think they are. They're, they are not? All right, we'll go forward, you can answer it. But what I'm, but what I'm saying is, if you, if you take 
a hundred acres and you mow down all those Joshua trees, and I don't care if it's $50 or, or $1,500, times that and put that on, on them. The other thing is, uh, as far as the, the uh, trucks carrying waters, Boys, you're a little bit behind. They've got U-Hauls now yeah. with, with the uh, lift-up doors and everything, and they've got cubicles of water uh, in those things. They don't care if they uh, run it into the ground, but now we've got to get the U-Haul people and the, uh, and the other uh, guys who rent those trucks to be on our side because that's how they're get, getting away with it. We were at the, uh, the cluster box, Bob and me, and we saw three of these things going up and down a, a Sheep Creek. Well, there's no way to tell. Oh, yeah, a lot of people moving. Bull. Thank you. Okay, my name is George, and I live out in the northwest portion of the county. Um, our problem out there, of course, is that we're in Marijuana Central. That I, I've countered 34 farms just from my property that I can see. But anyway, one of the problems we're having is eco. You know, they come out there and plow up ground. Uh, I've been living out there 25 years and I've seen desert tortoise. Now now there are no desert tortoise. You know, we have uh, all the little creatures, uh, brown burring owls, uh, the, the kit fox. You know, they got no place to go now. And then before the illegal growers got out there, they had an ecosystem and every, everybody worked together and, and it was good, but now, with 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 the eco all screwed up um plus the trucks all night long run by my house day and night trucks and and we've had four truck rollovers for these guys who who can't drive and we had six pickups flip over and and you know and it's just of course we're so far out we're we're, we're five miles uh, north of El Mirage Road, you know, we're in the unincorporated area out there. But uh, yeah, we need, and LA County was on County Line Road and they had four deputies out there siding the illegal trucks. I mean, not to LA County, and, and if they were really jurisdiction, I think they actually were in San Bernardino County, but I didn't care. They were getting the illegal truck drivers. Anyway, um, we need help, and, and, and we got to put teeth in this. We, we can't just give them a little slap on the wrist. We had one out by me that got busted, and they were gone six weeks, and they come back, and they're five times bigger than they ever were. So we, we got to put some teeth in the, when, when they get busted. You know, take the property. You know, the, the DEA, if they bust somebody, they, they confiscate the property, and that's what we need to do. Anyway, thank you. Hi, my name's John. Um, it seems pretty odd when our governor wants us to save 15% of our water and these guys are stealing 36% of our water. Why isn't he sending shit down? I'm sorry. Why, isn't, why aren't we getting stuff from other, other places? If they want us to save 15%, it seems pretty odd if they're stealing 36% that something should be done about it. The other thing is, is even if you catch them filling up at the fire hydrant, it takes an officer two and a half hours to get there. So by the time you, they get there, they're gone. And it's not like I want that guy coming to my door and asking me, where did you see him? Cause who knows they're a cartel. Then they're going to be coming to my house looking for me. It's just pretty rough when we're supposed to save 15% and they're stealing 36. All right, looks like we have our last question, and once again... Kim, oh, Kim, I'm going to jump in in regards to the Joshua tree. It is being studied to, to say that it is an endangered species, not to say that it was illegal to do the grading. It is illegal in uh, San Bernardino County to not grade your property, to tear them down. When they come out for a grading plan, they are marked, they have to be transplanted or built around. You cannot tear them down. Hi, this is for the water company. I live by two illegal grows, one of which, and I'm sure you all know of it, Duncan to Sierra, 10 acres. One right down the road for me, a residence with two illegal grows. Live, people living on their property illegally. The one with the 10 acres, I've lived there illegally for three years, have three citations. 
nothing's being done. They, the water company, I called because they were doing something, not the water company, the people living, living there, with the water meter. So I called because I thought they were doing something illegal. No, it was the water company allowing them to put a backflow preventer to make it legal for them to grow. I don't, I don't understand. Our water bill went up $30 this last month. It hasn't, we have an in-ground pool. Our water has not changed. It's been in there for over a year. It's been the same consistently, it went up $30. Why? Well, why, let me, let why me. Why are you, no, you're allowing them to make it right. You're making money off of it. Well. I know a person hauling water legally. This person had a meter legally purchased by you to deliver to illegal farms. Why? Look, there's two, two parts to the question there. I'll, I'll address the last one first, which was the, um, the water haulers. Um, there are people that have construction meters. We have a lot of construction that goes on in the district. We, can, we do not have the personnel to police who is doing what with the water. We, just, we don't have those powers for one thing. And number two, the talking about the backflow prevention device on the meter, we do we do make sure if there's agricultural things going on whether it's legal or illegal or if it's a business or not or if it's a residence we will make them put a backflow device on there we we demand that so there's no cross contamination back into the water system because we're here to protect you and provide quality water i mean we are we are highly regulated and we do that so you know i have to agree with you i don't think it's right that people can get water through the meters there's only certain things we can do legally to keep that from happening and we're doing everything that we can possibly do that's exactly why we're sponsored here today bringing the community together to talk about it um you know we, we have such a high amount of theft of water it's realistically probably 10 percent of the water in the system which is unaccounted for well stolen that we believe and we just don't have enough employees to go out there and police that nor do we have the powers the the employees at the water company can only do what they can do. I'm the manager, they answer to me. So we we do the absolute best that we can possibly do. Hi everybody, my name is Gio Rosales. First and foremost, I wanna say thank you everyone here today uh, presenting. All of our people in our community, I just wanna thank you guys for asking excellent questions and really contributing, seeing all your faces here, I see a ton of different people, you know, diversity. I myself come from Los Angeles County. I bought a house here uh, up over by Pinion Hills. We moved here because we love the rural living. And I stand with everything you guys have to say. And I truly believe that we're working really hard. Our law enforcement here, I've had you guys on our side several times. I truly believe that you guys do a wonderful job delivering for our communities. I've called you guys twice. Um, to get services from you guys and you guys have always been great so thank you first and foremost i wanted to ask a question related to our future this is going to be more related to all of what we're seeing but what we want for our communities and i know that we mentioned a lot about real estate prices we mentioned a lot about our community's future right the children that you guys see playing in this park here and their futures right yesterday and even the last couple of days i've been asking people that are you know in college right now where do you guys see yourself going to school after you guys go to vcc right because a lot of them attend locally my question is what exactly is the plan for the area in terms of our community development when it comes to not only community safety but for providing more resources to help deliver so that we can keep keeping our community safe and what is that what is that action plan that we have in mind and that's my biggest question is kind of from here on out what is it we're looking to do for our community's development i'll answer part of the question i can't um, we don't have land use powers or anything but what we're trying to do is provide for the community um, this is one of the two parks that we have in the the district areas we have one in pinion hills which is a park smaller than this we have two community centers but if you look back here at the property back to the housing track behind us and all the way over to the school and the five acres next door is planned for community park um, we've been working on this getting the conditional use permits um, going through the county 
that should be coming up and you should see some construction starting within the next year we've also put in for some grant money which is probably close to eight million dollars worth of grants so we're looking at building out the park to the best of our ability um, we are limited on the funding that we have for parks most of our revenue is from water uh, but we are looking for community involvement when we get into doing these parks one of the things that we always hear is we want some kind of a water park here we want a community pool um, there will be some things coming out within the next few months talking to the community about what the plans are and how active the community would like to be in supporting something like this the tax revenue that we get would not support a community pool and it will build part build out part of the park um, it's not going to do all of it but we are look, doing whatever we can do to make the community a better place and safer for children thank you Hey, to, to your point and to the future of our kids it's our job to keep them safe and they are the future they're going to be wearing the uniforms of these men and women here shortly and we're going to make sure that that's ha that happens we have great partnership you're seeing it here but the reality folks is the numbers that these folks are up against are much greater your voices have to be very loud they're loud to us we're going to be loud as well the September 16th date and a number of things are very important to rural county living if you look at even what's happening to sheriff's departments, sheriffs themselves, they're under attack in terms of assembly bills. Who can be the sheriff? They're talking about just any registered voter, no law enforcement experience, a number of things. That bill is shelved right now. It's coming back with a vengeance in January. So it's up to us. If we like to live this way, we have to support it. Our voices have to be loud and we have to vote. And we need to get people that have similar values to all of you in office. And we'll support you doing that. I can tell you the men and women of this organization are the finest you'll ever see. It does not surprise me at all that you've had the experiences that you've had. You will continue to have those. And we will continue with the support of these folks, the Board of Supervisors, particularly Supervisor Cook in this district. He wants to bring more deputies in. We're going to bring more deputies to the table. But it really takes our voices to change some of the things. And we'll get it to a place where it's much easier to operate and live the way you want to live. With COVID, a lot of the insurgents of folks to our neighborhood, everybody got tied up in those cities and they realized, hey, what they've got going on out in Feelin' is a pretty good thing. So there's more people going out here. We're getting a lot of great diversity coming into our communities. Let's leverage that thing. Let's vote. Let's keep these folks in office. And let's not let people screw with us in the way we like to live. Thank you, everybody. I just want to remind you, we have our question cards over there. If you would mind going over, write down your questions. We will assure you that they will be distributed to the appropriate person here. I want to thank everybody for coming out. It was a great event. We had a lot of people. It I just wonderful. want to say one last thing. I know you guys probably came to listen to us, but really, we're here to listen it, it, to them. it's no real I know it's echoing. Let me stop here. Where does it go now? It's way more powerful. Good grief. <laughs> it's way more powerful than you think for us to be energized and actually hear people who think like us. I'm telling you, at the Capitol, those numbers are so crazily, overwhelmingly nasty. And the craziness just seems to keep getting worse. When I think that it can't get worse, it does. So, when you guys get engaged and you have not been demoralized and you still come together and still trust us to help you, it helps us. It helps us be better. So thank you for braving the heat and gathering together because this has really helped me today uh, be re-energized. And I'm telling you, between television and that capital and everything else, you start your vision starts to get blurry. So this refocuses me and allows me to... Uh, be a better representative. So I, you guys deserve a lot of credit for being here and not becoming cynical and just blowing it all off. So thank you, thank you for all being here.